is not new to us, we know him. We have uh, no CME earlier with him, but we know him from, say, I think uh, his uh, three, more than three decades of uh, association in Delhi, at least I have seen him. Abhi to party shuru hui hai, inke saath, so it will be continuing. So I want to comment one uh, point about Dr. Viveka. He always gives, gives us rescue CME, which has given, it was, I, I can say, a translocation or transplantation of CME, partly or whatever. So, Dr. Mani Padamshri, he was awarded uh, Padamshri in 2013 by President of India. He is a legend. And he has, passed, he has done 8,000 plus of pump CM, CFBG. Yes, big, big achievement. Uh, I will not go into more details. He has been with so many prestigious institutions like uh, starting from Patra, with uh, Apollo, with now he is with Max. And. Uh, yeah, and he was uh, uh, My dad was backbone with the Heart and Lung Institute of uh, Ambedkar, uh, Dr. Sethi, my friend also, is a great part. So, his experience is primarily in cardiothoracic surgery and also uh, I will rather invite him instead of uh, posting about his work, let us learn from him what is the latest about cardiological uh, surgical procedures. Thank you, sir. I really feel very privileged to be here addressing you people and uh, I, I thought we would have a nice uh, kawali with Vivek but uh, <laughs> uh, unfortunately he has to go to Ghaziabad so I am doing this solo now. So uh, this is uh, what is the you know the situation of cardiac surgery. Because there is, a, there is a mix going around that uh, cardiac surgery has been totally replaced by interventions. So I just thought it is my duty to tell you what is the situation. this dubious topic of cardiac surgery in an interventional theorem. Aim of intervention in cardiology is not to eclipse surgery. Percutaneous interventions have been progressively more acceptable than what it was in the previous millennium. But even today, PCI cannot totally replace cardiac surgery. Advancements in technology and techniques in both specialities of cardiac sciences are astounding and indeed both cardiology and cardiac surgery endeavor to improve quality and quantity of the life of the patient. Cardiology is becoming more invasive while surgery is becoming less invasive and more cosmetic. It is not at all a turf war. Today's cardiac care claims to be less competitive and more complementary. There is no conflict. Together, cardiologists, cardiac surgeons wish to offer the patient CCC or comprehensive cardiac care. Progress in the treatment of heart disease has been greatly Felicitate, facilitated by the heart team concept. It's almost 70 years since the first therapeutic procedure on the heart was performed by John Gibbon in 1954, uh, where an ASD was closed using the heart machine. While surgeons 
busy themselves doing more complex surgeries with newer technologies as it came. And we adopted beating heart surgery in 2000, we were one of the pioneers when I was in Apuro. And we kept on adopting new technologies as and when they were introduced to us. When we were doing that, the cardiologists also extended their field of work to more invasive ways of tackling both coronary and valvular heart disease. Both these specialities now meet at the heart team to advise appropriate therapy. As you can see, this is the slide in which we work now, so that we have changed that me concept into me. We, we study, they review guidelines together and then adapt the therapy to the monetary status of the patient and also his life expectancy. We tailor the therapy to the patient and not that tailor the patient to the therapy, be it coronary, valvular, or degenerative. Areas in cardiology where the heart team approach results in benefit to the patient. I have only chosen two uh, uh, disease subsets, namely calcific aortic stenosis and functional mitral degeneration. These are the areas in which a surgeon has no problem doing an aortic valve replacement, as you will see, we have done so many of them. And today the cardiologists like Viveka have no problem in doing a transcatheter valve implantation. In functional mitral regurgitation, we used to see that the only treatment available was mitral valve repair, and that too would be at a formidable risk. Today we have the mitra clip, which can be done by the cardiologists. In addition to these, there are other areas in which the heart team works together. In a distal left main stem, where I can easily put a lima lima white, whereas they can put a bifurcation stem. In triple vessel diabetes, bypass surgery can be done by the surgeons. Multiple stents are equally good. Closure of parent doctors, atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect. Cardiac surgeons can do an intracardiac repair, whereas the cardiologists can put in devices. And neurisms of iota, we used to do open repair and we were always worried about the blood loss, which have really been revolutionized by endovascular stent. And if the tissue valves that we have put in, if they degenerate, we were worried how to do a redo MPR. Now we can do a valve in valve. So that is the benefit of the heart team. But today I am only going to speak on calcific aortic stenosis and functional mitral degradation. Calcific aortic stenosis today is handled, traditionally it has been handled by the surgeons, which is called the surgical valve replacement. On the picture you can see the calcified uh, aortic valve. As you can see it is all calcium. This is a tricuspid calcium aortic valve and this is where this is taken out from a patient before we put in a valve. Now the same thing can be achieved by a transcatheter aortic valve implantation. I am objecting to it being called the replacement. We do not take out this valve. We only push this valve to the side and keep it in a stented position so that you have a wide opening in the middle. So it is really an implant not a replacement. This has become standard therapy now since the beginning of the new millennium and people like Dr. Viveka have gained experience in this and they do it with a flourish. The standard of care in low risk patients is surgical valve replacement. The standard of care in high risk patients is transcatheter aortic valve implantation. The patients in the intermediate group are individually advised on a case-to-case -case basis. As physicians, I seek your cooperation that we should not let the patient preference be the deciding factor. We should tell the patient what the scientific literature says and not say, 
हम तो टैरी कराना चाहते हैं सो दैट दैट्स नॉट द वे दैट वी शुड चूज द प्रोसीजर वी शुड चूज द प्रोसीजर ऑन इट्स मेरिट दे हैव टू बट देन आई गो के दे ऑप्टिमल तरफ टोटली एज पर साइंटिफिक गाइडलाइंस similarly i will be talking about non calcific mitral regurgitation what you can see on the right side is a picture this is the normal structure of the left ventricle this is a geometrical cross section and the conical shape of the heart this is what most of us who do have heart attacks will have and after infarctions there is spherical remodeling whether we like it or not it continues because of a series of biochemical and molecular biological changes that occur including apoptosis which follows myocardial infarction when the ventricles they are starts remodeling from conical shape to a spherical shape because of the myocardial infarction this leads to separation of the papillary muscles as you can see this is the situation of the papillary muscles they are so close to each other in the conical situation and these are the body which hold the mitral valve and then they are separated because of the spherical remodeling so the body are not able to hold it they hold it for a while but then this causes separation in separation of the mitral leaves this is what is called the mitral regurgitation because it is a functional mitral regurgitation we call it functional mitral mitral regurgitation in ischemic heart disease and it's really a vicious cycle and there is a cause effect uh, 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 phenomena which comes into function that is there is functional mitral regurgitation causes volume overload this again causes a left ventricular dysfunction and so on and so forth so we must therefore address this mitral regurgitation with either of the four five options available to us pharmacotherapy you are all more familiar about this than i am surgical repair i'll talk to you about this mitral trip what we wake up as and valve in valve or redo surgery these are all the options by which we can do valvular heart disease and how surgery and intervention can together benefit the patient let's concentrate on calcific aortic stenosis for a few minutes surgical aortic valve replacement is by the sternotomy and this has been done since the 60s i have done about 3000 of these in my 2000 cases but can now be done by a smaller incision also mini sternotomy john is going to be a specialist in uh, minimally invasive surgery and we can do it by a right small anterior thoracotomy also but this needs cardiopulmonary bypass as you can see it requires multiple sutures of anchoring the uh, this is the valve which has to be anchored into the aortic annulus and this is cardiopulmonary bypass using the cannula this carries a list a uh, risk of 1% or less and in the absence of comorbidity that is a procedure of choice in low risk patients there are situations when the heart team would ourselves we would review the anatomical details and deliberate recommended surgical valve replacement even if it is uh, the patient prefers that's what i was saying earlier we should not go by the patient preference we should go by the uh, scientific data But we all know that in narrow aortic route we cannot do that in bicuspid valve it is a challenge because sometimes the tab can cause coronary obstruction when there is very heavy calcification of the left ventricular outflow tract there again transcatheter things are to be the transcatheter valve can be broken if the coronary height that is from the annulus to the coronary ostia if that height is very low then if you put a transcatheter valve the coronary will get obstructed and you will have a death on the table so these are the situations that we recommend electively surgery even in a, i mean of course in low risk we recommend surgery but even in intermediate risk we would recommend surgery in any of these situations low risk surgery i am saying surgical valve replacement why is that why not tabi low risk well 
below 60, the normal life expectancy, joints would be very durable, mechanical valve, with lifelong meticulous anticoagulation. Today, with uh, a lot of uh, uh, laboratories coming up, all getting accredited by NADL, the prothrombin time estimations are not so difficult as it used to be when I started doing valve replacements. Now they are very standard and uh, if we can keep them on anticoagulants, these patients last just any, any length of time. They can be normal uh, social animals. About 60 of age, the choice would be a tissue valve. A tissue valve, there are two types of tissue valve. One is the porcine tissue valve made from the pigs and the other pigs aortic valve or it is from the bovine pericardium of the calf. Above 60, the choice would be a tissue valve which could be expected to last for relatively long periods before the second, pre second procedure is required. What you see here is a tissue valve and what you see here is mechanical valve. Mechanical valve this is, uh, this is made of pyrolyte carbon. This is thrombogenic. So whenever there is uh, a person who is not adequately anticoagulated, this will uh, uh, trigger the coagulation cascade and you will have thrombin, uh, I mean thromb thrombus in these struts. And if these struts get blocked, the valve gets stuck. So this is a tissue valve. Tissue valve do not have a need for continuous anticoagulation. Though this portion of the tissue valve which is on the periphery will need anticoagulation in about six months time. After that the tissue does not need any anticoagulation. About 60 the choice would be the tissue valve which would last till a second procedure can be done. The modern tissue valve, the Inspiris Resilia, made by the Edwards company not only lasts only 20 years, but it is nearly 20 years, but it's constructed in such a way that later on, if you want to put a transcatheter valve through this, the ring expands. So like, like for instance, this is a 23 valve, and if you put a uh, balloon inside and expand it, this uh, ring will break, not break actually, separate, and it will accommodate 25 and sometimes even a 27 valve. Though in space, this India is almost thrice the cost of a mechanical valve, it is nowadays becoming the valve of choice above the age of 60, subject to affordability of the patient or the payer. Insurance companies are coming forth nowadays to support the India valve also. Of course, it's, we are supported by merit. I have to mention that even uh, we have implanted uh, the aortic valves in, uh, made by Merrill also. They are also bovine meric pericardium, but they don't have this expandable ring facility. But it's a good valve. And going by Narendra Modi's uh, Make in India concept, I think we should support the Merrill valve whenever it can be done. But the advantage of a resilia is that it can be expanded. Personal experience, as I told you, we've done about 3,000 odd surgeries. I have not exactly looked into my data, but approximately 1,000 mechanical valves. And as part of a double valve replacement, we've done about another 500. Tissue valves, four side, we've done about 500. And tissue valves, go wide, we've done another approximately 500. Resilia is a newer valve. I have done only five surgeons who have done more. I am also working in a hospital where affordability becomes an issue because all the rich patients do not come to me. Tissue valves with coronary artery bypass surgery is a common thing these days. And all these situations, as you can see, why I am saying in low risk patient, we should recommend surgical valve replacement. The mortality is one to two percent maximum. And in uh, the resilia that we have done five cases, there has been no mortality. We have not lost any patient after surgical valve replacement in the last five years, notwithstanding comorbidities. Now, I should speak on behalf of the patient. 
relatively new procedure done in the cat lab where the gripped aortic valve is delivered through the groin and then it is positioned in the new position in here and the positioning of the valve will be delivered through the groin and then expanded and this is the final result you can see on the right side where the valve has been placed there. During the time of placing the valve, when the heart is contracting, then there can be a catastrophic obstruction, a terrific afterload, because the heart will be functioning against the closed orifice, which is damaging the subendocardial ischemia, and it can cause an infarction. Furthermore, it can cause calcium embolization into the carotids. So we do rapid pacing for a brief period. 60 to 90 seconds, during which this balloon dilatation can be done. Deep sedation is normally enough for uh, doing cavity procedures, but general anesthesia, especially short general anesthesia, may be preferred by many of the uh, uh, angio I mean the implanters. There are such situations when a heart team would prefer transcatheter valve implantation over surgical valve replacement. Uh, even if somebody says I can do it with a one person risk. Super seniors, patients over the age of 80, redo status with patent coronary grafts sutured to the aorta. As you can see, now this is a picture of the aorta. Some of you have grafts here. Then doing an aortic valve replacement, you have to cut across those grafts. So that is the situation where we ourselves would say, the heart team would say, let's go for that. Coexisting renal disease, patients on hemodialysis. Now in these situations, the transcatheter valve scores over surgical valve replacement. Extreme COPD, precluding prolonged anesthesia. Whenever we do open heart surgery, we can never predict that you can extubate the patient on the day. We can extubate 95% of the patients within 12 hours. But it may so happen that some may require prolonged ventilation. Coexisting mitotic disease, I mean any kind of cancer, if there is there, there are some slow going cancers, there are cancers which are related to the blood, which can cause uh, bleeding problems. So in that situation, we prefer to give them uh, transcatheter valve. Now in the indications and contraindications, as you can see, surgical valve replacement can be done uh, except when there is mitral annular calcification. Uh, that is one area where I am afraid to do a surgical valve replacement because sometimes they are associated with mitral incompetence and it is impossible, almost impossible, to take out the mitral valve and the annulus is totally calcified. And there we would rather recommend a uh, transcatheter valve. The transcatheter valve has nothing to do with the mitral. It just goes and sits in the aerobic valve. Whereas if you're doing a mitral valve and you see a lot of calcium and you have to do a double valve, it becomes a big problem. Isolated aerobic regurgitation with aerobic endase. This is not meant for TAVI. TAVI cannot be placed in isolated aortic regurgitation because the TAVI, the principle is it trims on to a ring. If there is no ring, it cannot be held. So it will migrate. So in isolated aortic regurgitation, we cannot do uh, uh, transcatheter. Narrow aortic. The, trans, uh, the, uh, the technique of doing uh, TAVI involves a certain amount of tension on the aortic root. And you know, if it's a 19 aortic root, and then you, the only valve that you have is 21, <coughs> you try to squeeze it, especially if there is cancer pain. And then there, there can be what is a very dangerous kind of a complication called the aortic annulus rupture. That has got a 50% mortality. So in a narrow aortic root, if you can send them for surgery, we can do an aortic root replacement and we can put a surgical valve replacement. Same thing in LVOT calcification. And LVOT calcification, when we 
start doing driving them almost in, or invariably when end up in a heart block. Low coronary ostia, that is if the coronary ostia are situated very close to the annulus, so anytime we dilate the annulus, as you can see that this portion of the, uh, the transcatheter valve is all <coughs> covered by a stent and this will obstruct the coronaries and you will have a problem on the table. In a bicuspid valve, Vivekha is going to speak to you about this in shortly. So it's plus minus situation. As I said, between green and red, there are many shades of valve. Complications as anticipated. Tabby, complications of heart block. Six percent or more patients who have tabby can have heart block. Surgical valve replacement, only one person. Paravalvular leak at the procedure, five percent in tabby. We don't have paravalvular leaks in surgery. Coronary obstruction can occur in three percent. It can be salvaged, especially with a balloon expandable uh, uh, valve. We can salvage it, but with the nitinol expanding valve, it's less likely to be salvaged. This is why in bicuspid valve, where we cannot estimate where the coronary ostia are going to lie. Coronary ostia can have an anatomical variation in bicuspid valve, and that's why we don't re recommend that in bicuspid. Patient prosthetic mismatch. This will not occur in TAVI because TAVI generally gives a much better valve orifice. And I will let you know in the next few slides why a better orifice can be achieved by TAVI and why a smaller orifice is resulting in, uh, in the severed room. Uh, this is called a patient prosthetic mismatch. Like if I have to put a 19 valve in a 100 kilogram patient, the body surface area nearing 2 meters, that patient will have a patient prosthetic mismatch. So that he will continue, even after the aortic valve replacement, he will continue with unrelated left ventricular hypertrophy and therefore the results may not be very good. Whereas if you do a TAVI in them, you can put a bigger valve. I tell you why we can put a bigger valve. But aortic annular structure, one has to be very careful. We should not be very aggressive in putting very big valves because the aortic annular structure on the table is about a 50 percent mortality. You can't get the patient out of cap valve. If you have a CVA, if you have a CVA uh, in, uh, in transcatheter valves, a little more. In uh, surgical valve, it's not very much because we, it's direct vision. We can see what calcium can go here and there. And during the cross clamp, the iota is cross clamp, all the head vessels are all clamped, so the calcium cannot go. Whereas if you have a transcatheter valve, the head vessels are open, so the calcium can just go into the cavities and they can have a stroke. The partner, there were three partner trials, partner one, partner two, and partner three. In the partner three, the exclusions they had was frailty if a patient was only say 40 kilograms, bicuspid valve, ejection fraction less than 30 percent, fast CVA, COPD. These are all situations that they excluded in the partner 3 trial. Why am I talking about partner 3 trial? Partner 3 trial told us that TAVI <coughs> is equal to surgical valve in this. But if you exclude a portion, portion of the candidates who are eligible for valve replacement and you only do the, the big ones. If you do cherry picking, you can have a results. The dilemma in calcium aggregate stenosis, as I told you, partners 1, 2, 3 claim non-inferiority of TAVI to sour in high risk in intermediate risk patients. In low risk patients with expected longevity of 10 years or more, it would be prudent to offer surgical valve replacement with mechanical valve less than 60 years and with expandable tissue valve if they are more than 60 years. What is the logic of doing surgical valve replacement in a low risk patient? You can do a TAVI after surgical valve replacement, say after 20 years if the surgical valve gets degenerated, you can always do a TAVI. But the reverse is not possible. If you have done a TAVI and 
20 years on the night, the Tavi Val will fail much earlier because it's a grim to battle. So after 10 years, so suppose he wants another operation to be done. Uh, both removal of that implanted uh, Tavi Val is very difficult and it can end up in quite a lot of problems and morbidity. Technically also, it is a very difficult procedure to take out that transcatheter valve. Whereas if it is a surgical valve, you can get it out easily. In a transcatheter valve, the, the catheter, because there are no sutures, it is a nitinol which is getting incorporated in the aortic wall. So they are very difficult to remove. So that is the logic that in the beginning, you do a surgical valve mechanism. And if necessary, later on you can do a transcatheter through the valve. All you need for a transcatheter valve to stay in position is a ring. Either it is a calcific annulus or it is a valve ring that we have put in. Either of them will work as a good anchoring place for putting the transcatheter. If patient develops coronary artery disease, which is quite true, which is quite common, we all live in a very high heart disease area. If you put a 60 year, if you put a 60 year, you put a tally or you put it in a 55 year old and at the age of 65, he needs coronary artery bypass surgery. You cannot put any graft on the ascending aorta. So you can do a lima rima bind, which is not, which is the only solution. That you don't touch the aorta at all. You do a left memory and the right memory. Stitch the right memory to the left memory. <coughs> that is possible, but you know these are all situations that we should avoid. Why I am talking about this is coronary artery disease, even though a person does not have coronary artery disease, there is no guarantee that he cannot have it later. So in all these situations, we believe that surgical valve replacement is the choice in low risk patients. Why do, you, why do you get a smaller aortic orifice and surgical valve replacement? We in fact, logically, you would say that you are removing all the calcium, you are decalcifying the annulus. So why can't you put a bigger valve? Why is the daddy being able to put a bigger valve? And why the surgeons are not able to do it? The drawback of surgical valve replacement, technically more cumbersome to tie knots Either we have to tie it manually or by the core, core, core knot technique. 18 to 25 sutures are required to anchor the aortic valve to the aortic annulus. Either it is like a mechanical valve or bioprocesses. Both of them require the same amount of suture. To achieve optimal sizing, we also have a supra annular uh, uh, positioning. This is a supra annular. This is the and uh, this makes us have the new annulus at a higher position than the native annulus. So you can technically, in a 19 annulus, you can put a 21 magnum. This is a supra annular valve. Even so, the valve orifice is somewhat less, especially if the root is not surgically wider. If the root is very small, 19 or less than 19, and the patient is more than 70 kilograms, then you will need root widening. That we will have to cut the annulus, patch it with a pericardium, and increase the size so that aortic valve can be moved. There was some brilliant uh, uh, concept called, uh, by introduced by a company called Mitra Flow, which uh, put the stents inside the valve and wrapped around the pericardium, around the stents, so that when the valve opened, it would have a bigger orifice. But it failed because the wraparound technique was not capable of handling the shear stress that occurs with the opening of the aortic valve. Sutureless valves. Now, it is the suturing of the valve that creates all this problem. And that is why we end up with a small aortic orifice. Now, if we have a sutureless valve, this will, this will be a game changer. Especially, especially in minimal invasive. In addition to cutting down the time of the surgical valve replacement, it will also help us to put a bigger valve in the same annulus where you have suture valves and without suture you can put a bigger valve. From a technical standpoint, 
suture as valves involves the treatment of the calcified leaf, leaf, removal of calcified leaflets, and annular calcium, and manual three dimensional positioning under direct vision. So, when we said that we cannot put a uh, trans catheter valve because we cannot really understand because what we are seeing in the catheter is a two dimensional view it is not three dimensional whereas in a, when you are doing a suture valve you can see where the coronary ostia is and you can avoid the coronary ostia from being getting obstructed that is also like the, the trans catheter valve it is a nitinol stented valve it expands on itself there is no suture required we just decalcify the annulus position the valve and let it open, it automatically fixes. Just some guiding suture, one or two are required to hold it in position. They are more expensive. Nitin out stents could pose a problem, especially if you have to do aortic ABR, CABG. Then these stents that you can see here, they will come in the way of putting a partial plan. So you cannot do this when you are planning ABR, CABG, unless you do it by some other way. So the rational approach in, in calcific aortic stenosis is first is surgical valve replacement. As I told you, below 60 it's always for surgical valve replacement. Below 60 is mechanical, and and then this is the lifelong procedure. But if you're going for a tissue valve bioprosthetic, then after the second after the bioprosthetic fails in 10 to 15 years, and either you can Reoperate on the patient and put a surgical valve replacement, or you can go for a transcatheter valve and inside the surgical valve. That's a that's an easy job. And then, in case after he needs a third procedure, then if you have already done a surgical valve replacement, then putting in a tie is easy. But if you are putting in a transcatheter valve as a second operation, then putting in a valve in valve is also very easy. So I feel that this should be the uh, 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 an algorithm for using a surgical valve replacement as a main strategy. If you go for trans ionic valve replacement by a trans catheter method, and if there is a, a requirement of a replacement, then you have to expand it and do a surgical valve replacement, or you can do a tabby in tabby. Now this also can cause a lot of problems and obstruct the coronary. Tabby in several, of course, can, can be done, or we can do a reoperative surgical valve replacement. This is the procedure sequence as it has been reported in uh, this year the Journal of Perifines. Now the other valve problem that I was talking to you about is severe functional mitral regurgitation of the non-calcific type. I'm not talking about rheumatic mitral regurgitation. That is not the topic of the day. This comes from functional regurgitation as I told you how the functional regurgitation occurs. We'll go back to that figure where we saw the geometrical portion of the ventricle becoming spherical while papillary muscles being pulled apart resulting in regurgitation. In 1991, a surgeon called Alfred Alfieri, Italian person, demonstrated that converting the mitral orifice from a single orifice to a double orifice. This you can see here is a single orifice which is leading into regurgitation. And what he did brilliantly was he sutured these two leaflets together. This is called the Alfieri stitch. And you see there is uh, no leakage here. And of course, this has been further assisted by putting in a mitral ring around the uh, repair that he has done. But somehow, this didn't catch on very well. And I'll tell you in the next slide or two why it failed later on. But most of us, including me, including my innings at DHLI in Apollo, we went to uh, Amaron Bombs doing mitral repairs, uh, inspired by visiting French surgeon Alan Carpentier, who did a number of workshops in R India Institute and also in Apollo. And uh, he said structural restoration of the mitral valve using caudal leaflet and annular assistance devices demonstrate a competent valve in the peri and post operative period. 
agreed. When we left the operating room, we had uh, our echo choreograph it has fantastic repair, there is no leak. But then when we sent them home, they came back two years later. And again, you see uh, initially you see them they are going for Disneya, they require more diabetics, and then you hear a murmur, and then after that they develop very more feet. Then you find that these panels which look perfectly alright and at the table and even at post off, they started to leak. And we were wondering what happens. The answer is again going back to the same diagram which I told you earlier, that the spherical remodeling that keeps on separating the microwave. So even though you have repaired it, it keeps on separating and the co-optation, you know, you have to have a 6 millimeter uh, co-optation of the two leaflets for a good pocket that keeps separating. So the leakage happens again. So then came this mitra clip. Sorry for that spelling mistake. It's not mitra clip. It's a mitra clip. No, it is a mitra clip. It, it is on the same principle as the one done by Alferi. Alferi just did this uh, smart thing of suturing these two leaflets. As you can see, the anterior posterior leaflets were put by a stitch. Then, Vivekas, Boss, and others, they thought that if we, Alferi can put a stitch, why can't we put? So, they went in through the, it's an easy, easy procedure, they went in through the uh, inferior meningema, they punctured the septum, because they were used to doing that for balloon martial dalgotomies, punctured the septum, and put in this uh, clip holding device into the left ventricle, and then they, this is the uh, mitra clip, as you can see, this goes into the, this goes into the left ventricle and then when you pull back, it gets stuck in the mitral leaflet and then you take out the catheter, the clip holds the two leaflets together. Dr. So, Mani, can we make it a little short so that we have more interaction? Sure. Sir, thank you. How mitral clip continues, uh, comes to us at a high cost? This is the difference between Alferi stitch and mitral clip. I think this is technical, we can skip it. <coughs> mitral valve repair, as I told you, follow up. Mitral valve repair is associated with the recurrence, basically because, as I told you, the spherical remodeling continues. And because the spherical, however good your mitral valve repair has been, uh, this is we have done a posterior advancement and this is a ring. And how what we do, they recur because the leakage occurs because the separation of the microwave. However, when we do a microwave replacement, this is not happening because irrespective of spherical remodeling, the valve continues to be compromised. Reasons for failure, as I told you, and this uh, maybe it's a little repetitive, but uh, this is because of the separation and that is why functional vital incompetence continues. And because of this vicious cycle effect, once incompetence occurs, it just gets worse and worse. Physicians must have really realized the value of the benefit of using ACE inhibitors in the past and recently RD, especially Y mana, combination of Secutrin and Mansertan and also the new drug very, very sick bar may possibly result in better outcomes by reducing the spherical remodeling, which is the uh, reason for much Durable tissue well, of course, is an answer, but it is a better cost. So areas for heart team concept to work together. Of course, I have told you calcific aortic stenosis and functional mitral stenosis. In addition to that, we have other areas in cardiology where we can work together. As I can only reiterate, together each one achieves more. Thank you very much. Uh, Doctor, Doctor, please, sir, please come here, sir. Please come here. We will have good discussion for at least half an hour. Light, Jalal. Please, sir.
Dear friends, this young, we had a wonderful talk as a first interaction with Dr. Mani. I didn't want to interrupt him, but it was my uh, impulsion because we have lesser time. <laughs> also, Dr. Vijayana has taken his talk. So, we want more and more interaction so that we clear our doubts. So, from your side, it was a very, very free flowing and lot of knowledge. So, so to set the ball rolling, uh, I will ask only a few questions, sir, mm -hmm. about cardiac board approach like the team approach, surgeon and the physician together. So, what is the best for the patient? You decide. It was wonderful to see that you and Dr. Vivekka make a very, very good team. So, multiple stents versus CAPD, how to decide? I, I, I thought that, that I'm going to do it the ne next year. Yes. <laughs> Pardon me if I have uh, interrupted. My, my own feeling was one with you, one with Dr. Vega, uh, and one together. That makes the uh, uh, thing uh, together because it is one plus one, it's one and one. Nelson's number. One, one, one will be triple one. Yeah, I back. And, uh, what, what decides whether multiple stents, what are the number of stents that bar you, that after that you will go, go for a uh, CABD? Is it five, seven or maybe more? Uh, I, I think... Uh, uh, I, 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 I'm uh, referring to a uh, very renowned politician. I may not name. He, he came to escorts and also he was seen by Dr. Trehan. Dr. Trehan advised him uh, surgery. Dr. Ashok uh, Seth had uh, advised him stents. And ultimately decided stents because it was without surgery. Your comments, how many number of stents versus surgery is better uh, surgery? It's a very really complicated question. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I don't think the number of stents is really something to worry about. Because if you can do one stent, you can do two. If you can do two, you can do three. That's not the issue. The issue is whether the patient has got a good runoff or not. If he doesn't have a good runoff, and if the artery is very thin, they're more, more foreign body, more thrombogenic. than In diabetic patients, the results of surgery are far better than putting in number of stents. I will limit my question, sir. Surgery done for uh, uh, CAD, for heart failure, for uh, well malfunctioning, and also for heart transplant. So, your uh, easiest uh, of the uh, procedures, what do you prefer? Uh, I think. Um, it's just like asking whether you like breakfast, lunch or dinner. <laughs> 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 so, is a simple operation. Uh, I was involved with the heart transplant patient program in Australia. And uh, we found that it was delightfully simple and the patients recover very well. But today, the challenge is not doing the surgery. It's getting the donor. And with the so many increase in uh, helmets and uh, traffic lights and uh, more uh, uh, good automobile control, I think the donors are not coming for us. So where where we can, we were we were having more donors, we could do more. Now the heart transplant situation, even in Orange and Sydney, they are not able to do so many heart transplants as they could do. But having said that, the five-year survival after heart transplant today is 90 percent. So if you can do a heart transplant and you get a good donor and you get it in time, the period is only about four hours. You have to give the donor heart four hours before that it has to be transplanted. If it cannot be heart transplanted, then there is a solution. So of course we have police assistance, we have green corridors, they can fly a aeroplane, uh, uh, you know, they can get emergency landing and take off and all that is happening. But still, if you delay the retrieval, heart retrieval to more than four hours, results are not 
doing culinary happy by first surgery or lab replacements, I think it's it's all it's all a matter of experience. The more you do, the easier it becomes. I will ask my next question in my next meeting with you, with Dr. Viveka, sir. Uh, sir, wonderful presentation. Uh, there were some very important uh, carrying on messages for us. We used to think, you know, that Tavar or Tavi is the ultimate thing, you know. And if we can uh, save patient from a very lengthy uh, surgical procedure, it's very good. But you explained very nicely that sever is the procedure of choice in a patient who has got severe aortic uh, stenosis. Sir, I want to know, is there a criteria of transvalvular region on which you decide whether this patient is good enough for TAVI or he should go in for sever? Uh, the gradient doesn't matter. Uh, we, we have operated on surgical bar replacements, 150 gradient or even more than that. That is not important. What is important is the whether it's a bicuspid bar, whether the coronary ostia is very close to the annulus. These are the situations where Terry will have a problem. And surgical bar replacement will not have a problem because it's an generic. So in a young patient, we would say surgical bar replacement should be the first choice. Not only that, in India we have to be conscious of the cost. Now, even though uh, the medical people can deliver uh, a trans uh, catheter valve in 15, 16 lakhs, but really how many, I don't know, I mean this room will have people who can afford 15, 16 lakhs, but if you go and see the patients who are coming to me, unless they are supported by some company or something, insurance doesn't pay them that much. Surgical valve replacement you can do in five. In mechanical valve you can do in four lines. And uh, surgical tissue valve you can do in about five lines. So I mean the comparison is, and the, if you want to put a sophisticated valve either by Medtronic or uh, by Edwards, uh, Sapiens valve, these are a quote of 30 lakhs. Now how many people, like Microclip is 35 lakhs. I mean, I mean we can talk, academically it's easy to talk. <coughs> But, you know, how many people can generate that much money to spend on themselves, especially a person who is in heart failure? He will not do that. If CGHS pays or insurance pays, that's a different story. But on his own, I don't think there are such deep pockets. <coughs> Maybe industry will settle. But I would say, in India today, for the, the all and sundry, surgical lab replacement is easy. We have developed techniques by which we can do it very safely. As I told you, I was very honest in telling you the last uh, five years we have not lost any aortic valve replacement. Uh, there are comorbidities. We learn to manage them. I don't want to do that. So I think the take home message would be that use that trans catheter valve for high risk. Sir, what is the longest surviving patient of yours after SABR? Uh, my own brother-in-law, I have operated upon him in 1993, uh, 90, 30 years, 30 years. Oh. He has to be your continuous anti Yeah, he is a mechanic. But he knew 30 years ago, if you put a mechanical valve, but he is an intelligent guy. He is a computer engineer. So he looks after this anti-coplane. He used to be after every now and then. But uh, he is able to man. And ionic valve, you know, it's a high velocity valve. So it's not clot the valve. So if you can maintain your INR, you say about two, that's good. Is he on the water today? He is, is on acid. That's water today. That's water today. Sir, one of the, uh, one of the upsides of the uh, tally, please, please, one of the uh, upside of the tally or whatever is, uh, that they do not require light of anticoagulation, number one. And many of the newer bioprosthetic valves, actually, uh, maybe after a month or two, they do not even require double, uh, 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 even the double anticoagulation. Only uh, aspirin will work. Your comment on that? Three months. 
Well, I think, you know, the uh, surgical valve replacement, and first talk about that. See, there is a background skirt on which we have to take the sutures. Now, it is, uh, you know, what happens after the background skirt is put in and it gets sutured and it's getting planted, the endothelium grows over it. It takes about six months for the endothelium to completely cover the background skirt. Then it's all become a tissue, 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 tissue everywhere. Then there is no need for antibiotics. But till the background skirt is not covered, it remains uncovered, you need to protect it, because otherwise spiritlets will go and sit there, or RBCs will go and sit there. And then it can form a nidus for either a vegetation or a thrombus or something. So I would say, even in the modern tissue valves, including the zinia, we would like to anticoagulate for six months. After that, of course with no axe, it's, it's an advantage. Again, I can use it off-label. It's not a, it's not a guideline uh, warranted uh, therapy. But off label we can use Novax in tissue values. Uh, Novax, is anybody with even one episode of a fibrillation today is a guideline for Novax. So Novax is a pretty safe thing. Of course it cannot be monitored by programming time. So that can be a But for mechanical values that won't be Tissue valves are great uh, advancement in the treatment of uh, uh, empty stenosis and they save a lot of mortality and mobility. One of the uh, problems with the bioprocessing valves have been that they generate, they regenerate and they can regenerate eccentrically. You don't know. There is no duration after how many years. So in your experience, people who have had undergone TAMI or TAMOR, with these bioprosthetic valves, what is their longevity and what is the quality of the valves that they are getting? See, this, uh, this whole technology is only 10 years old. So we really don't know how long they will last. But the people who have been uh, involved in explanting the tally, they have lost patients on the table. It's very difficult to take out that valve which is incorporated into the aortic valve. Surgical valve is only in, in, sutured onto the annulus. You can cut the suture and the valve will come out. It's not a suture. So it's gone into the tissues. And then you have to cut the tissue out. Many, in one of the cases, my friend, Sandra Shekhar in Koyamoto, he wanted to take out the valve. He couldn't take it out and he had to do a ventral procedure. That is, to replace the whole ascending aorta. So these are situations that, that is one of the reasons why I say first procedure should be a surgical value. Second procedure should be a value. Sir, I wanted to ask you the last question. You mentioned about people less than 60 years of age and the preferred uh, uh, mode of treatment being seven. I got that message from your side. Sir, people who are even above 60 years of age, and if they do not have a compelling indication, they are simply beneficiaries, they still need a medical board to decide whether they can go in for a tabby or tab. So why cannot a consultant level person sitting in Max or Fortis or in Vedanta decide why the patient has to go to a medical board for CGHS beneficiaries? Your comment on that? You see, <laughs> because you know, if a person is 50 and, and he is unfit, then I would myself say go for that. But if a person is 75 and he is very fit and there is no other comorbidity, why should I deprive him of the surgery? First procedure should always be surgery. So I should do a surgery. Just because he's more than 60, you know, I mean, I mean even our prime minister is about 70 years old, but he's fit. He can run a car. So I don't think that this 60 is any landmark to do. decide on time. I, I would agree that. Just the last question, sir. But I would say it about one person. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Aptar, sir. Sir, good evening. The total in biosynthetic wall, the longevity will be 10 to 20 years. Does it depend on the size of the well or some other factors also? Very good question. I mean, because we, not, we have not answered this as yet. Uh, yes, a smaller well will degenerate faster. That way you are right. Uh, but 
but there is no correlation. There is a host reaction. You can put a bovine valve in a person who is quite fit and that will degenerate in seven years. And you can put a porcine valve which is supposed to degenerate in seven years. It will last 15 years. So there is not a variation of the host, how the host reacts to the tissue. But by and large, I would say 10 years is the ballpark figure. After 10 years, generally, it is recommended that they will have to have. And that is where the value of Sever is. I mean, uh, that, is, that is when you have a valve ring, it's very easy to put a, a tissue, uh, another tissue valve into that tissue valve. And I told you the Resilia valve, when you put the tissue valve, that valve ring will accommodate a bigger valve. So if you put a 21, 10 years later you can take a 23 in Tavi valve. So that is the advantage of this. When you are talking about a surgical uh, open heart surgery, 21 millimeter, meritonic, how much life it has known me? Depending on the patient? Uh, yeah, it depends yes. on the patient. It will vary from patient to patient. Up to? Roughly about 10 years. Maximum up to? Uh, maybe, you know, as I told you, you know, anecdotal cases do not prove the rule. Yeah. Uh, anecdotally, I have patients who are living 15, 16 years after tissue valve implanted. Meticulous, uh, they look after themselves. One thing which I have found very important, again, this is off table, is the use of statins. Statins improve the life of tissue valves. If you give them statins, the tissue valve lasts long. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Mangal, sir. You know, after the family, if the patient comes and says that my dyspnea is the same and the cardiologist says my valve is working well, Uh, I, I didn't understand. This thing has to be because of uh, respiratory causes also. No, no, no. Before doing, uh. before doing the TAVI procedure, uh. the patient had dyspnea. And the, after complete evaluation, the cardiologist says this dyspnea is due to your this aortic stenosis. Now patient comes and he says that my dyspnea is the same. And they say that my valve is working well. <coughs> then they say you go to the pulmonologist. We find his lung functions are fairly okay. And uh, <coughs> how to answer this patient? Yeah. This patient came from Nepal and he had undergone uh, this procedure. And the valve is working well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The so gradient. cardiologist says that the valve is working well. But what are the numbers say? <coughs> numbers are fine. Well, I think that's a very difficult uh, situation. But must be a combination of, uh, like for instance, one of the patients who had, uh, uh, you know, uh, triple triple standing, again going back to coronary, uh, triple standing, was saying that his dyspnea had become worse. Uh, that is because he was on Brillanta. We stopped the Brillanta and dyspnea became worse. Well, well, yeah, but I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah. Everything is well explained. But I was just asking. Now, I, I would say that if the numbers are good, it's unlikely because of the procedure. It may be some other comorbidity. But if the numbers are not good, yes, we'll have to put in something. Sir, uh, Dr. Mari, sir, my, my friend at the back, he wanted to ask a question, but he said you asked it on my behalf. Uh, it's a little touchy question that I don't know by. He said a uh, case of severe AS sent to a cardiologist, he finds an indication for a TAVI. Send it to a surgeon, he finds an indication for a severe. Your comment on that? I think I have explained it very well. I thought so. Anyway, my, my say is that if the patient doesn't have any risk factor and the person is in India and is middle class, we should go for surgical cardiologist. Right. Uh, uh, I'm sure Dr. Kutsi, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chuan. So, uh, Dr. Mani, that was a wonderful talk. So, in the current era, the interventional cardiologists are becoming more and more invasive while the cardiac surgeons are choosing to be minimally invasive. How true is that, sir? In the current era, the interventional cardiologists like Dr. Viveka 
are becoming more and more invasive. And the cardiac surgeons like Dr. Ganesh Mani are choosing to be minimally invasive. <laughs> a kind of a, yeah, there's a meeting point, we're going to the same place. <laughs> this is so Good true. Answer. Anyway, let me proceed further. Dr. Penny, cabbage still remains the gold standard of treatment for multivessel disease and is still the treatment of choice for triple vessel disease and left main. The syntax, ascent, and the freedom trials are all shown superior term results of cabbage versus PCI in terms of survival benefits too. The current evidence favors and supports terror as a first line therapy for treating severe atrix stenosis, but the crucial question is some anatomical difficulties like bicuspid or unicuspid walls. So for those patients probably the sever <coughs> probably is the gold standard here. Enough data to support sever as compared to the table. What do you say sir? Yeah, that's exactly what I said. So I think uh, unless there is uh, a serious contraindication, like for instance if a person has got COPD and you cannot take an anesthesia or the patient is on dialysis, I won't send an aortic stenosis patient for the first time and if he is below 60, definitely not for a TAVI procedure. TAVI procedure is meant for either a second time or for an older person who has got comorbidities. Otherwise, surgical valve replacement, not only, not only in India, even the partner 3 trial that says that in low risk patients, there is no indication for TAVI because they are going for a second procedure. And if the second procedure has to be another TAVI or another surgical valve replacement, it's more risky. So if the young patient comes, there is some businessman who came to me and uh, we, we got to go big automobile uh, business in Karol Bar or some such place. So he came to me and his uh, son was about uh, 55 years old and he says he's for TAVI Then uh, of course we decided in the heart team this is a young patient, no risk factor, why should he have a daddy? So we put in a surgical valve replacement, we put a residual valve, he could afford it. And now he can come back for a daddy, he's doing okay in this two, three years. But he can come back and have a daddy. So talking about hybrid coronary revascularizations, the heart valve surgery combined with PCIs for concomitant CAD. Carotid artery stenting along with cabbage for high risk patients. Patients have shown to benefit with hybrid approaches. So probably hybrid approaches are the future in cardiology today. I agree. I Thank agree. you, sir. sir. One question is here. The ventricular obstructive obstruction and VOT. But of this cause is such a result and then it starts and such as that uh, you see this procedure this is having valvular, subvalvular, supravalvular, obstruction. So what what is the basic of this please dilate upon this as the OT? That particular outflow tract is below the aortic animus. There are two types of obstruction, mechanical and uh, you know spasmodic. This is called hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Now that's called whole come out. If it's a dynamic obstruction, generally beta blockers will help them to reduce the gradient. But if beta blockers don't work, then we can do septal ablation. That is, with the first septal artery, we can inject some alcohol into it, and then that that portion will have a controlled infarction, and the hypertrophy will become less. If you still can't get it done, then you do a surgical myotomy. A surgical myotomy is the problem is that you have to cut right uh, into the LV outflow, take out a chunk of muscle. So LV outflow obstruction, if you rule out dynamic, then only you should go for surgery. And before surgery, a septal ablation cannot happen. I have another question. When we are using tissue valve for seen on the body, there is a possibility of air fixes most reaction. So what are the any should we give them also some immunosuppressants? Because we are using tissue valve, which is a, you see, MD, 
वाले नैंडी के और सीन आप हो गए तो आर दे आर प्रॉब्लम्स ऑफ दिस इंजेक्शन आई आई हैव नॉट हर्ड ऑफ यूजिंग इधर एंटी माइटोटिक और इन्हेंनो सब्सिशन फॉर इंप्रूवेंटिंग डिजेनरेशन देर हैज बीन स्पोरेडिक रिपोर्ट्स अबाउट स्टैटिन यूसेज बट आई हैव नॉट हर्ड एनी एंटी एंटी माइटोटिक ड्रग्स a young boy around 26 years old has undergone pental osteoporosis so it by aortic stenosis or ligamentosa so what is the long term prognosis it was done 10 years back excellent excellent i have one pental uh, who is a child of mine here done 20 years ago he no. doing very well no problem he has to be on warfarin long time he has to be on like it is a mechanical man yes he got so Doctor Johan, so I, anything else? So uh, now it's time to uh, give it to Dr. Tagas sir to summarize this wonderful CME by Dr. Manish sir, and uh, and and we look and we look forward uh, to more interaction with Dr. Manish Manish sir. I think Dr. Dr. Tagas is still okay. So I think. Doctor Ganesh Mani, you may not be knowing, he is a very good singer, excellent singer. So we would like to hear a song of his choice, any any song from of your choice. Very good, sir. Yes, sir. sir one song, one song of your choice before we wind it up. He is an excellent singer. Oh, very good, sir. Very good. Sir, I I think that first I will be liberated, so that I will not be liberated. No, no, he is not done. He is not done. So, sir. जो हुक्म के बारे में बताया था anti uh, myosin uh, medicines are coming to, which will prevent the uh, uh, remodulation and hypertrophy of the muscles they are in the pipeline sir so, sir wonderful talk you very well explained who are the best patients for uh, savvy versus tabby so savvy is better first choice for most of us those are less than 60 and less of uh, Chances of complications. Those who are high risk, of course, can be maybe considered because they are not fit for surgery. Sir, your uh, choice of songs are.